I do want to start this video by saying that I have something very important to ask of everybody who's watching this video at the very, very end. So if you're interested in watching the whole video anyway, please just stay for the last minute or so. Just, just do me the favor, you'll see why. Let's get to the intro. Yu-Gi-Oh! is a game about collecting cards. Everyone who plays it knows that, but everyone has different ways of going about it. Most people skip packs and buy the exact cards they need from secondary markets. Others buy only sealed products such as packs and structure decks, living and dying by the luck of the draw. Some are lucky, some are smart, and I am neither of these things. In this series, we'll be fusing horrendous luck with even worse financial decision making, with the full intention of ripping off Nim Nim and Reps. We'll be rewinding to the nostalgic days of our youth to build a competitive deck with a strict budget of $25 and only using sealed product. This is Yu-Gi-Oh! Restart, a budget sealed only challenge. So in terms of next steps, here's what I was thinking. I decided to scrap the idea of Shadals because that seems really boring and desperate when we could easily find a way to make charmers work without using them as the engine. For now, we need to start assembling some kind of charmer link monster deck, so the most reliable way to do that would be the 2020 Tin of Lost Memories. While it only has Hida and Win, it also has some important cards like Extrav, IP, and even Dragoon, which could be important if we decide to stick with pure charmers because the Dragoon engine is very strong. And possibly we could even lean into Dogmatica, but that's getting ahead of myself. The Dragoon engine may clash with Extrav, which is probably the biggest concern that I have, but for now we should just start opening packs and we can think about that another time. Let's see what we've got. Alright, so episode 2, let's see what we're getting into. Like I said in the intro, we got the 2020 Ten of Lost Memories, 3 packs here. And we've also got 2 packs of Eternity Code, that's just kind of a supplementary thing. These cost at $6 each on TCG Player, which means $18, plus $3.50 each, $7, exactly $25. The goal with these is Hida and Win from these packs. I think Asa is, in, is the one in this, I, I don't know, but we can always see what we get. Let's start with the Eternity Code packs because they're not the most exciting. Resonator Commander, Codebreaker, Virus Berserker, Proxy F Magician, Deep Sea Minstrel, Ancient Warriors, Ingenious Zhu Kong. Uh, I don't think this can be played. Zebroid X, Thunder Dragonlord, Deep Sea Sentry, Magical Hound. Nothing very playable from this one. I don't expect to get the cards we need immediately off the bat. You know what? Let's not open that right away. Let's pop open the 2020 Tin of Lost Memories, and there is the chance that we don't get anything playable at all from any of these, but let's let's hope that doesn't happen. Salaman Great Wolvie, this... Bombable Chamber of the Unchained, this is my favorite deck. You know what, maybe I'll run an Unchained engine, who knows. Fury of Fire, Cliffhanger, First Hollow, Nightmare Incarnation Idli, Xerzio, Ruler of the Evil Die, Cypress Quantum Dragon with some pack damage on the top, Marin says Marble Drock, and Gizmek Orochi. All right, um, that's a maybe. I don't know why the name is very low. I don't know if you guys can see that for some reason. I wouldn't call it a misprint, but it's weird. It's, it's a possibility as just kind of like a, you know, a kill button. Uh, Tengi Spirit at Hara is actually a pretty good card, so I'm going to put that off to the side because it might be a possibility to run. Destiny Hero Draw Hand. Uh, let's put this to the side. I'll read this later. Dino Wrestler and Guard Dragon Cataclysm. Not the best pack, but not the worst either. Uh, we got a couple of usable cards if we decide to run the Gizmek Orochi engine. And sorry for the noise. I have my microphone aimed at me right now, but who knows what will happen. Subterra Succession, Galactic Spiral Dragon, Rocket Synchron, Dino Wrestler, whatever. Horace Velger, the Desperate Doom Eagle. Tenue Spirit Nahata. I'll, I'll put that here. Why not? Let's collect the Tenue Spirits. Marin says Seahorse. Witchcrafter Creation. Oh, interesting. Extravagance. Oh my god, what a start. <laughs> I'm actually really happy to see this. Witchcrafter Masterpiece, interesting. But Extravagance is actually going to give us a good edge from the start. I will immediately throw this into the deck as soon as I show the next build. Uh, Successor Soul, Valkyrie Verte, Dolce, Tenny Spirit, Vishuda. <laughs> you know what? I only think Adhara is the one that will work with the deck, but I'm going to put them all to the side anyway just because I feel like it's fun. But yeah, let me throw this off to the side. A pot of Extravagance. That's nice. I like seeing that. Next pack. Let's open another 2020 Ten of Lost Memories. You know what? Maybe we could get a second extravagance. All right. So here we've got Dino Wrestler, Marshall Ampello, Morchlag, the worst name for a card ever, Dwimmered Glimmer. A Did we get one of each Tenyi Spirit? 
Hold on. Okay, Salamurton Great Re Recurience. Dark Factory of More Production. Valkyrie Erda. Evil Eye Repose. Secret Rare. Guard Dragon Pisty. Ah, uh, that's disgusting. Unchained Soul of Rage. And it's an effect monster. Psychic Wielder. I don't think we run any level 3s that we can use this with, but, you know, it's not a bad card. Um, Time Thief Regulator. Time Thief Bezel Ship. Infinitrag Brutal Dozer. Guard Dragon Justitia. Salaman Great Transcendence, Defender of the Labyrinth, and Katobli Pass, Familiar of the Evil Eye. Last pack we need, Eternity Code. Let's see what we get. Hopefully it's something playable. Let's see. Deep Sea Artisan, IQ, Deep Sea Minstrel, Pinpoint Dash. It's a secret rare. It's an ultra. Ravenous Crocodragon, Archethus, Archethus, Archethus. I don't, I don't know. This is actually really good in uh, virtual worlds right now, but clearly we're not running virtual worlds. Maybe, I, I don't think we could find a use for this, but we're going to need supplementary for Pot of Extravagance anyway, so I'll put it off to the side. But yeah, you know what? It's <sighs> the only card that's really of note here that is a guaranteed run is the Pot of Extravagance, especially because we didn't pull any other extra deck monsters that we can run. Um, funny enough, this is probably where the first stage of that selling cards that we don't need may start to come in because ravenous crocodile dragon is pretty much unplayable in our deck we run no tuners and i don't have any plans to put any in um the goal with this one might be to sell it for you know two three bucks that's two three bucks added on to the next week and that's two three bucks that we might be able to use for the next deck or for the next opening but yeah let me start working on the deck and see where we can go from there all right so here is what we decided to do these are the cards that we decided to drop. We dropped the Witchcrafter Golem Ururus because it just felt kind of unnecessary. Uh, as much as I love the two Awakening of the Possessed cards, these are hard Garnets and I never want to see them in my hand. So, you know, running three and two, you're guaranteed to see one of them and it became a huge issue. I just knocked over the entire deck. Sorry about that. Um, removing one of each of the summoned beasts, I guess. I don't know what you call them because it just felt too clunky and i feel like if you get one of the other ones you could at least get that attack boost off of awakening of the possessed so i'm dropping one of each of them and i'm dropping raigeki because i think it's too slow this is a going first deck obviously we're running solemn warning possessed partnerships grand spirit on each ring. so i'm dropping all of these um we are adding in one copy of asa and hita because it just makes sense to have uh, an extra normal summon i felt like a lot of hands were really bricky without any summoning uh available to me Ratting another Ichirin, as much as I ragged on it earlier on, I actually do appreciate the fact that I can negate one monster effect for free. And stopping an Ash early on might actually be pretty useful. Uh, Jigabyte along with Ranryu, because we need a little bit more diversity in terms of, um, you know, attribute. We have Spell and Wind, or Spell and Wind, Water and Wind. Then we're running the one Gizme Karochi. I had a single game last time where my opponent survived with 550 life points. And if we ever just barely miss lethal, it would be nice just to have this in hand. Especially because for a card like Spirit Charmers, I would have to discard a card anyway. So having Gizme Karochi would be pretty useful. Especially just as a one of. And any more than that is completely unnecessary, especially if I pull any more. And the last card, obviously Pot of Extravagance. This is a great pull to get on our very first pack opening. I was honestly surprised that we even managed to get it, but you know what? We're going to make it work for now. Um, aside from these cards that we're adding into the deck is just supplementary monsters for the extra deck. None of these are really going to be able to be summoned. Um, I did have the option of maybe being able to summon the Croca Dragon by putting in the Tenyi Spirit Adhara, but I decided against it because I just felt like it became a techie engine that I don't think would be very reliable and I don't think it's worth running the engine as much as you know i i love tech options i don't think it's very good um yeah that's how we're gonna play the game from now on we're most likely going to be trying to draw into x drive every single time because the deck does have a lot of draw power involving uh awakening of the possessed considering you can summon on your turn and your opponent's turn but i am talking too much so let's see what we can do now Game 1, we are up against Witchcrafter Dogmatica again this week. Apologies for the same matchup as last time, but I just think real duels are more interesting than YGO Pro. We win the dice roll and get to go first, and I am warning you guys now that there are a lot of misplays. We start off with Spirit Charmers throwing a Roche in the grave to get a set Awakening with Possessed and Heat at a hand. 
Activating Awakening, we summon Hita and draw off the Awakening to get a Baylor in hand and a Warning on field. We special out Nefarious Archfiend and send both to the graveyard to get Nefarious Sir Archfiend. Nefarious Sir activates to bring back Hita, and with Awakening on the field, both of my monsters gain 600. We set Spirit Armors and pass. Our opponent starts with X-Drive, getting the draw 2. He then uses Witchcraft or Creation to get Madame Berry, and then uses Unveiling to special summon her from the hand. He summons Pitore and attempts to use her effect to summon Hain, which we promptly solemn so that he doesn't get to pop anything off of Hain's effect. I then go ahead and use Orochi on my turn to give all my monsters a 900 boost off of Awakening of the Possessed. In main phase 2, I summon another Archfiend to get Awakening of the Possessed to my hand to beat over the Vare, and he negates the U Archfiend to stop my special summon from the graveyard. I use Possessed Partnerships when he summons Ecclesia to get the extra attack boost from my Awakenings and pop the Vare. We terraforming to get Ichirin and summon Wind to get another 600 attack boost. At this point, any monster effect he activates is negated, and every monster I control gains 2400 attack. This is the killing blow, and we win game 1. Game 2 we don't side since our side isn't really as consistent against the deck that we're playing against. Our opponent starts with x -Drive like every other time that I've ever played against him. He then uses Nadir's Servant to send Titanoclad and add Ecclesia. He normal summons Pitore and uses her effect to get Golem Aruru and then pass his turn. On standby it goes back to his hand and we use Spirit Charmers discarding Hito to get Awakening and possess partnerships. And my opponent then tells me to let you guys know, yes I misplayed and forgot about all of my card effects, what about it? We activate Awakening getting the search for area off of Luna and the draw from Awakening gives us a Garnet. We special summon Gigabyte, giving every monster a 600 attack boost, and we attack directly for 4550. We then set Spirit Charmers at pass. At this point, I'm singing Visitation of the Ghost to myself, and he banishes Pitore to draw and send a Witchcrafter to Graveyard, being Madame Vere. He then uses Witchcrafter Holiday to special summon her back. He normal summons Ecclesia, which I chain Luna to, bouncing Vere, which he then chains Aruru to, targeting Gigabyte to bounce it back to my hand, which I chain Possess Partnership to. This resolves backwards, and we special out Area, which pops Madame Vary, and Gigabyte comes back to my hand. He specials out Fleur de Lis, and I chain Spirit Charmers to set partnerships and add Awakening. He activates By Street, and then attacks Luna with Aruru and passes. We draw into Gizmek Orochi, which gives us a disgusting OTK hand, getting the normal summon for win, which allows Gigabyte to come out, followed by Gizmek Orochi and partnerships for Hita, and we attack for game. Match 2 is against the same person using a different deck. Last week we hard lost the Trap Trick, so I thought it would only be fair to get destroyed again. He wins the dice roll and goes first, setting 3 and passing. We normal summon Area and special summon Ranryu and Nefarious Archfiend. Not really the best field, but not really the best hand either. I activate Secret Village of the Spellcasters just in case he misread his archetype's name as Spelltrix and send Area and Archfiend to the graveyard to get Nefarious or Archfiend, which then gets met with a Compulse. We still get to summon out Area and attack directly for 3350. My opponent summons Mantis and we literally have no interruptions so we just watch him play. He links into Sarah, then uses Shade Brigandine, and that's when I realize that I have two Nefarious or Archfiends in my hand. I know at that point he's just going to summon Romelio, pop my Secret Village, and nuke me with Utopia Double, so I scoop. Game 2, we side in Denko Seca and Twin Twisters, hoping to see at least one of them, which does not happen. Out of a deck that runs three field spells, we draw into all three and no spellcasters, giving us three dead draws. We pass right away, and our opponent goes off with Mantis, searching for Dianea, and links into Sarah. To summon a Parallel Exceed, give some Trap Tricks or Ecclesia on field, and 3 back row since he didn't trust that my hand could possibly be that bad. We draw into Fairy Tail Luna, which gives us a faint glimmer of hope that my opponent snuffs out on summon with Imperm, and gets a special summon from Romelio, popping the back row that I set for some reason. I have one other usable card, and I can't really do anything to any cards he controls, so that's kind of it. On his turn, we chain Luna to the summon of Utopia, doubling a feeble attempt to try to stop the OTK, but it doesn't do anything, so game 2 is a loss. So match 3 and we're currently 1-1, so it's not looking good. My opponent starts off with Pot of Disparity, revealing that he's playing Mutants, which I genuinely know nothing about. He uses e to summon out M05, which he tributes to get Beast. Field Spell apparently lets him summon ST46, from which he follows up by special summoning Nemesis Flag. He then uses ST46 with the Field Spell to summon Mutant Mist and apparently gets a search off of Nemesis Flag. He ends his turn with Arch Nemesis Protos from hand. As soon as my turn starts, he uses Mutant Cry to summon Mutant Synthesis to pop my face down, and I had almost no options, so I just passed. Knowing full well he could probably OTK me, but I didn't really want to bother setting or summoning anything that might just get popped right away. He summons Mutant Mist off the bat, and reading his cards made me realize that I straight up had no options, and he got game 1. Game 2, we start with Spirit Charmer sending Gigabyte. We add Hita to hand and set Awakening. Normal summoning Hita and getting the draw, then special summoning Nefarious allows us to make Nefarious or Archfiend and bring back Hita. We set Solemn Morning and pass. My opponent starts with another Pot of Disparity, and I wrongly assume that the choke point for Mutants is the Normal or possibly an E-Telly Summon. So I Solemn Morning impatiently on his Normal Summon. He then proceeds to use Mutant Fusion to summon Synthesis and pop my Awakening. He activates the Field Spell, which summons back his M05 and banishes multiple Necro Faces using its effect. 
he easily breaks my board with Beast and Synthesis, and I try to continue playing with the Luna Summon and get Possessed Partnership set. I wrongly assumed that a bounce and a pop would be enough, but all I did was bounce the Synthesis and get stampeded by Beast. The next turn I draw into Spirit Charmers, which my opponent allows to go through, but he negates my Awakening and I just have no options and lose then and there. So this time we ended this 1-2, which is pretty sad. In some regards we got some massive successes, and in others we had some colossal failures. I hate to admit it, but my touch-up of the deck in terms of ratios just made it even less consistent despite adding more combo starters and removing Garnets. I still want to find a way to make the Charmers work, and in terms of next steps I had a pretty fun idea while popping packs and opening collector's rares that Magistus is just generic spellcaster support and may work pretty decently with the Charmers. Especially with Genesis Impact Packs being about $1.50 at the time of this video, which means that there's a very good chance that we could get all the cards we need from a couple of openings at most. My biggest concern is that our first opening gave us an X-Drive, and I'm glad to get the pull, but limiting our draw power through Awakening for the rest of the turn may be counterproductive. This might seem kind of dumb, but I just think Magistus look interesting, and that's half the reason I want to give them a try. A good option might be to just get the extra funds from the Crocosaur we opened and see if we can get a couple of Dual Overload or Mega packs along with the Genesis impact, just to hope that we can maybe get some other staple cards that we're still searching for from those packs. If we want to make this work, the goal would be getting Riliona, Artemis, and Zorua, all of which are ultra rare so we can at least hope for one to two at a time per opening. We can still go for Dragoon just in case, but Selene seems like more of a concern, or at least IP since we have nothing to do with Awakening of the Possessed Monsters once they hit the board. Here's the point that I say what I want to say. At the time of this video going up, it should be December 26th, which makes it my birthday. I'm not asking you for a like or a subscription for my birthday, although that would be greatly appreciated, but I just want criticism as my gift, if you can do that for me. If you think the intro is worse than the first episode, please let me know. If you want to play as one of my matches, just leave a comment or message me on Twitter. If you think that the way I'm going through this is too casual with a deck and you think that I should be trying for a more competitive strategy, I want to know that as well. As much as I enjoy making this series, I enjoy knowing that other people are enjoying it even more. And I'd like to do everything in my power to make it as entertaining as possible for you guys. With that said, thank you so much for watching the video. If you liked it, please leave a like and consider subscribing. If you want to see where the series will go, please just hit that subscription button. I'll see you all in the next video. Have a great day and or night.